Welcome, everyone, to this briefing brought to you by the Israel Defense and Security Forum, IDSF. In Hebrew, name is Epitronistim. IDSF is a leading Israeli organization advocating for strong national security to defend the state of Israel. Thank you, of course, to all of our viewers and supporters for tuning in to this briefing to allow us to bring you behind the headlines what is really happening here on the ground. It is a great pleasure today to be joined by Colonel Gidi Harari, who is coming to us from the north Lieutenant of Israel. Colonel. Sorry, Lieutenant Colonel Gidi Harari coming to us from the north in Israel, uh, where there is a lot of activity um, as Israel is potentially bracing uh, for a war uh, with Hezbollah in Lebanon. Lieutenant Colonel, thank you so much for joining today. You're welcome. Thank you. Why, why don't we start off with just a general update on what you see from your perspective up north, uh, developments uh, in this war on the Lebanon border, please. Well, actually, we are uh, in a very tense uh, time uh, since uh, there is an escalation in the last a little bit more than a month. And uh, the, the escalation is, is coming from both sides. And uh, I don't know to tell you who is who started it or who is first, but it's clear that uh, Hezbollah is using more sophisticated weapons, mostly drones and uh, anti-tank missile guided anti anti-tank missile missiles guided uh, by by television. And uh, Israel, of course, is responding with using more weapons, with attacking more strategic sites of Hezbollah in Lebanon, uh, more attacking uh, in the in the north of Lebanon, in uh, the Beka Valley, uh, about hundred kilometers from the border of Israel. Uh, concentrating more and more on uh, attacking uh, HVTs, what we call high value targets. Uh, I'm talking about uh, um, um, high value targets, uh, meaning operatives of Hezbollah in the rank of uh, battalion, uh, battalion uh, uh, commanders and uh, and uh, brigadiers and uh, brigade uh, commanders of the brigades or special forces like Aduan or other uh, special uh, activity uh, official officials of Hezbollah. So we have reached a point that now uh, any of the sides, Israel or Hezbollah, will make a mistake by uh, attacking uh, the wrong. Uh, target by killing civilians, uh, it might bring us all to a complete war, even if both sides doesn't want it. So we are very, very in a very delicate, delicate uh, time. Uh, let, let me ask you, do you think that Hezbollah wants war? or they're being dragged into a war? Well, uh, a month ago, I was pretty sure that uh, they don't they don't want war. Actually, they don't want complete war. And uh, today, I'm not so sure. I think that uh, they want, they are trying to drag us maybe to a war, that we will start it. Uh, and uh, since there is a lot of disagreements between Israel and the, the United States lately, uh, they might get the impression, like their uh, bosses, the Iranian regime, that uh, the U.S. and the Israeli regime are uh, in a crisis. Well, it's, there is some kind of crisis, but there is still 
uh, uh, the, the pact between Israel and the United States is still very strong. Uh, but they might have the impression that uh, it's not so. And that might bring them to the decision to start a war. This is one side. The other side is Israel. Because Israel, if we will f might feel that uh, in the Gaza Strip, we are going to finish the war and might want to start it in, in the north. Because at the end of the day, I believe, and many people like me believe, that the war with Hezbollah is something in inevitable. It might, it has to be now, or it has to be next year, or in five years, it doesn't matter. It's not something that you can stop it, because the Iranian regime, which is conducting all, the, all this game in the side of uh, Hezbollah, they are declaring all the time that the biggest enemy, the biggest problem, the biggest issue that should be terminated in the Middle East is Israel. They are declaring it every day. So if we will not finish it now, it, we should finish it in the future. But finish it, it doesn't mean to finish with Hezbollah. The, la, the, the, real, the real issue is the regime of the Ayatollahs in Iran. If, for example, tomorrow morning we will wake up and all the Ayatollahs are not in Iran anymore, so Hezbollah also will not go for a war. But since it's not going to happen, uh, so it's 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 very it's a big issue. It's a big problem. So if there were to be a war with Hezbollah, which seems more and more likely, what does victory even look like as long as Iran would remain intact? How do you fight an enemy where they're not really the enemy? Or the only enemy, I should add. Uh, well, it, it's very complicated to define what it will be with the meaning of the victory in this war. First of all, we need to understand that both sides will suffer many casualties and the, the infrastructure of both countries will suffer uh, also big, uh, big problems. Uh, and Hezbollah, it's not something that we can uh, finish with them till the last uh, war, the last uh, Hezbollah soldier, okay? Uh, and uh, Iran fighting the Iranian regime, it means that we need the coalition of the United States, Britain, France and all, all the free world, and I'm, I don't see it happening. Biden, I don't think, can take a decision now to go into a war with Iran. Uh, what are we, f five months before the elections? It's, it's crazy for him. So we should be very cautious with it. I think that the... Um, what we need to think is the is to try to do something that uh, that will uh, let understand Hezbollah that what they can gain with the war is less than what we are, that what we are, they were going to lose. The deterrence that we thought we have with them should be very clear to them. And uh, uh, Hezbollah and Hassan Nasrallah is also doing the calculation is thinking also about Lebanon. The Iranians, they don't care about Lebanon. They care about destroying Israel. So what will happen in Lebanon, they don't care. But I think that uh, Nasrallah does care. 
and uh, we need to give the to give him the reason to take care about what is going to happen with his country. So are you suggesting that the, the only measure of deterrence for Hezbollah is not Israel's defense or what Israel could do to Hezbollah, but rather the Lebanese people and uh, their uh, reaction to Hezbollah? Yes. And is there are there factions within Lebanon society that that Nasrallah really cares about? No. No. Uh, Samir Jaja, which is the leader of the the Lebanese forces, what is called, uh, which is the Christian uh, the Christian uh, party, the biggest Christian party and the biggest Christian militia said yesterday or the day before that he will take out 20,000 uh, warriors to fight, to fight against Hezbollah. First of all, I don't believe that he can take out 20,000 warriors. Second, uh, he is not strong enough to fight Hezbollah. Um, I don't think that there is a real opposition to Hezbollah, military talking. Uh, inside Lebanon. Uh, and then in addition, we addition... will need we will need to strike them uh, very hard, very hard in the first week and try to finish it as quickly as possible. Uh, within within Lebanon, in addition to Hezbollah, you have Palestinian Islamic Jihad, the Maal Muslim Brotherhood. Aren't these all of these other factions, although they're rivals, they're all unified in wanting to destroy Israel. So if anything, isn't there support for that? Yes, but uh, the Islamic Jihad and the Islamic Brotherhood, they are not uh, such as they are not such such strong uh, force in Lebanon. So it's not. This is not the issue because you have, in in the side of the Shia, you have Hezbollah and Amal, which are two big militias that will fight us. Of course, that the Palestinians will join them, and the Hamas will join them. The Hamas in Lebanon, but the main issue is Hezbollah and uh, Amal. Hezbollah is like a small army. No doubt. In terms of a war with Hezbollah, do you think that would require Israeli boots on the ground in southern Lebanon? Uh, yes, but uh, I wouldn't go uh, northern than uh, the Litani River. It means that uh, 20 kilometers, 25 kilometers inside Lebanon, not anymore just to, to to be safe. We are not going to conquer Beirut now, like in 82. This is not the issue. Although we wouldn't conquer Beirut, I mean, would Beirut be under attack by Israel? Is that the stronghold that Israel would have to target? Meaning when you say heavy losses, would that include Beirut and being an airstrike from Israel? Beirut, Beirut should be the first strike uh, target to strike heavily and mostly the the Dahia neighborhood which is the headquarters of Hezbollah in Lebanon this is what this is this was part of the game changer in the 2006 war the two greatest targets that uh, will hurt Hezbollah is Beirut and Baalbek. Okay, and then let's let's look more kind of at the immediate issues going on because we're not at an all-out war, so to speak, with Hezbollah, but in terms of their daily um, missiles and drones being sent into Israel, what, what what is the status of that? Is there a lot of damage being done up north? Does Israel, does the IDF have a mechanism in place to mitigate 
th those damages? There is relatively a lot of damages, mostly in the kibbutzim and in the moshavim, which are actually on the border. I mean, zero to one kilometers from the border. Uh, in Metula, in Mizgavam, in uh, Manara, Malkia, uh, these are the main uh, places. Uh, there is damages uh, relatively to, to what is happening in the other side, in the Lebanese side, is not a uh, high damage. But relatively for the Israelis, of what they've seen in the past, it's a heavy damage. Mostly, mo mostly houses, not, uh, not victims. Now you say more damages are on the Lebanon side. I think there's 349 Hezbollah operatives to date that have been killed. Is that meaningful for Hezbollah? Do they look at that number and cry and start mourning? Or is that business as usual and it doesn't really have an impact? I Meaning they're not really feeling any pain right now. Well, one of the one of the differences between us and the the Muslims is that we, for us, the 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 dead are also important, not only the living. For them, the dead they don't count them. They mourning, of course, and they, they are sad about it, but it's not an issue that will stop the war. And the 349 operatives that are dead, it's, it's, it's a lot, but it's not a, a huge number, although there are a, a lot of them are high-ranked operatives. But uh, talking about uh, a number of uh, 60, 70, or 80,000 operatives that they have in Lebanon, 350, it's not a lot. It doesn't mean that we don't have to kill, the, kill more, but <laughs> it's not a lot. It's not a game changer. There was a recent report about uh, a Hezbollah arsenal building up in the airport in Beirut. Uh, do you have any thoughts about that? What is that a meaningful uh, report that came out? What does that tell us about what's happening there? It's not new for us. It's uh, about uh, Beirut airport, the Alma, uh, Alma Center already had a report about it one year ago. Uh, we know that there is a huge uh, arsenal of arms in the Beirut airport. Uh, it's an issue because uh, while there are uh, international flights arriving to this airport, it will be a mistake to attack the airport. But I believe that if uh, there will be a war starting, uh, the airport uh, of Beirut will be part of the targets that will be attacked. Lieutenant Colonel Kiri Harari, I very much appreciate uh, your participating in this briefing, sharing all of this with our viewers. And thank you to all of our viewers and supporters who are watching this briefing. Um, you know, it seems like in the international media, there's not enough coverage about what is happening in the north of Israel, what it means for the citizens like yourself up there and the prospects for war. So everyone who is watching this, um, Make sure to listen to every word Gidi is sharing and then share it widely in your networks uh, with uh, policymakers, with people in the media, so we can really get this information out there. Gidi, let me ask you a, a loaded question. On October 6th, the defense establishment thought there was generally deterrence in Gaza and everything was thrown upside down on October 7th. Right now, in terms of deterrence, because you mentioned that word, deterrence, is there this sense that we are ahead of the game with Hezbollah, or is there a potential? You know, God forbid we wake up tomorrow morning and find out that twice in one year, Israel was caught off guard. Is that a possibility? The simple answer is yes. But 
uh, deterrence uh, is defined by uh, making it happen. The uh, deterrence doesn't happen by talking or by declaring that uh, you will do so and so without doing anything. What happened with Hamas and what, what happened with Hezbollah until October 6th, that they, uh, in the last three years, they all the time tried us. And we didn't act. And I clearly and loudly are saying, I'm saying that deterrence, if you don't mean to use what is behind the deterrence, so don't think that you have deterrence. What I mean, uh, when you see Raduan operatives touching the fence in the on the border of Israel and Lebanon, and you don't shoot them, so you don't have deterrence. When you see the tents in the hard of in the mountain of Dov, uh, building two tents in the Israeli side, and you don't uh, take them out in 24 hours, and you're starting to speak about it, there is no deterrence. So deterrence, if you don't mean, don't say that there is deterrence. You need to show constantly to your enemy that you mean what you are talking about. Like Eli Valach said, in the good, the ugly, and the bad, when you have to shoot, shoot, don't talk. That's all. This is, you know, without saying a lot of uh, intelligent words and uh, academic uh, words, it's very simple, mostly with the, these guys. If you want deterrence, you need to show him that you mean, you need to show them that you mean business. Simple as that. Is that happening? When you have to shoot, shoot. Is Israel doing that? Are there really these they, Iran forces they, touching the fence and walking away? Today? Correct. Not enough. Not enough. And is that because not everyone agrees with your point of view? No, I think that we... Um, we are trying to do, we are trying to be, we are trying to not lose our humanitarian uh, issue, although we are dealing with people that there is, there is no humanity in there. And uh, we need to play the same game as them. I don't think, I don't mean that we need to act like them. But uh, if something is, if someone is reaching the fence, you need to shoot him. You need to shoot him. And if they are uh, burning our field, fields, we need to burn out their fields. And if uh, in Manara there is no light for three days, I don't want to have uh, electricity in all the villages around Manara, in the other side of the border. Simple as that. That's the language that they understand. That's the language. Listen, with Arabs, you need to speak Arabic, not to speak Yiddish. They don't They don't speak Yiddish. By the way, me too, don't speak Yiddish. But they speak Arabic. So come on, we are in the Middle East. We are not in Europe. Very well said. Lieutenant Colonel Gidi Harari, thank you so much for joining. Thank you, Moshe. Sharing all of this. Thank you to all of our viewers and supporters for tuning into this briefing. We will be back with you tomorrow, 10 a.m. Eastern Time, 5 p.m. here in Israel. Until then, stay safe, stay strong. Take care, everyone. Thank you.